Hello and welcome to the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. I am Vlad and today my guest is Zach Vol. And this is actually the first ever crossover episode with the Coin Podcast, which he hosts. So this is exciting. How about you also do the introduction, Zach? So this legitimizes our crossover. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, having me on your show, Vlad. I'm I'm excited to uh, jump into some Bitcoin discussion on your show, and um, I'm glad to be here with you as a couple couple Bitcoin podcasters, um, just uh, chewing the flab and talking Bitcoin. Sure. I'm happy to be on your show also. And yeah, the, the coin me. pod is the coin Since... pod's a lot of fun. Um, it's uh, it's a, it's a good time. A, a very Bitcoin focused podcast, which is sort of the same thing as Bitcoin takeover. And uh, we, we should have some good conversation. Oh, yeah. How about, you know, we talk about our common ground in political science and politics and use it in the context of Bitcoin. How do you see Bitcoin as a mean for international affairs? And do you think that it can be used, for example, as a currency for oil? to bypass embargoes or other uses like this? Absolutely. So I, as you mentioned, we both uh, share a common academic background in political science. Um, I attended a small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania and studied, um, among other things, politics and economics. Um, The college has a pretty strong Uh, Austrian economics department, um, which is why I attended and along the way also studied politics. And one of the things that got me interested in Bitcoin was my studying of Austrian economics and politics in tandem with that. um, I had a roommate who introduced me uh, to Bitcoin while I was in school and have been hooked ever since. And to your question, I uh, obviously I feel like the, the question is uh, almost indisputable that Bitcoin is a very valuable tool for um, fundamentally reshaping the way that international politics is handled. Um, not only the, the means in which international politics um, issues are handled, but the, the actors that handle them as well. Um, and I, I, just to be succinct, I obviously think that Bitcoin is a very useful medium of exchange, um, it has enormous potential to be a global currency for, um, among other things, uh, oil and circumventing uh, potentially inconvenient political restrictions on financial exchange among uh, differing, uh, among like uh, political tensions and whatnot uh, between world powers. Yeah, first of all, I have to say that I went to the kind of university which is pretty left wing and I only had one class which taught us about Austrian economics in the context of macroeconomics. So we only had the larger context and we studied a bit from the classics like David Ricardo and Adam Smith. And we didn't specifically get into Milton Friedman or Hayek or some other economists who adhere to some extent to the Austrian school of economics. But I did get to read about it. And in my case, the discovery of Bitcoin was a bit different. It was more about self-study and reading the news and finding some news pieces which were declaring the death of Bitcoin in 2014. And at the time, I think it was the Washington Post or The Economist or... I don't even remember. It was one of these more or less left-wing oriented publications which declared the death of Bitcoin and how it's just this digital mean which helps drug lords acquire more capital and bypass (laughs) the oversight of the Fed or whatever. At the time, it was this narrative that it's both a Ponzi scheme and a drug coin. And... I read about it. I got onto the dark net. I I think at some point I even visited the Silk Road to see what's all the buzz about. I never 
it, it was just pure curiosity. I never tried to buy Bitcoin. I even saw one of these services which were merging coins so that you'd have your transactions obfuscated so nobody would know where you got your Bitcoin from. It was interesting to read at the time, but I didn't get financially involved until it was actually too late to invest and I got wrecked pretty much. But that that's how I actually became more curious. Because when you realize that you're not going to make any money, at least you ask yourself, okay, does this at least have any kind of future? There is more to this than actually speculating on exchanges. And I, I think some people got lucky. And right now I think there's some kind of financial advising gurus who know all about cryptocurrencies. While others have had this kind of curiosity. And what I saw in Bitcoin, ultimately, after I discovered what kind of technology it is and how it stood the test of time and how all the narratives of mainstream media and governments haven't really affected the technology itself, I just realized that it, it's actually a mean to sanction abusive governments. When you refuse to use their currency, and you decide to run a parallel kind of economy which is simultaneously global and decentralized. Decentralized meaning that it's not bound to the rules of any government and no government or association of governments can alter it or bring any kind of modifications to it. Then you're basically buying your way into freedom and you're making governments become much more accountable than they already are. Absolutely. I think um, the power of Bitcoin, as you mentioned, a parallel market that, I mean, it's often referenced as sort of an opt-in economy that you, no one's forcing you to use Bitcoin. No one will ever force you to use Bitcoin. There it will be uh, increasingly strong economic incentives to use Bitcoin, but no one will ever force you to. Um, it's 100% voluntary and uh, everyone who participates in Bitcoin um, at some point has been at the position that you described where the price initially is maybe a, a considerable attraction that gets you interested in Bitcoin, whether it's the crash and the, the so-called death of Bitcoin as it's often heralded at, through bear cycles um, or a skyrocketing bull trend in Bitcoin that attracts people with the potential of earning a, a quick profit. And then they come to the critical point where they have to decide, is this something I actually want to stay interested in? Is there any uh, substance to this Bitcoin experiment thing besides just maybe earning a, a quick buck or, or several? Um, and that decision point, which, I mean, those of us who are here obviously made the right choice, but that decision point is a crucial turning point for everyone interested in the space. And those who decide there is nothing more that interests them besides the promise of profit, which it, they're quickly disillusioned of, um, and then leave. It, that's sort of a choice they may regret later. Um, that remains to be seen. But I am of the opinion that you only ever really experience one bear market, and that's your first bear market, because the, the trend with Bitcoin, at least historically, is always higher highs and higher lows. And so the first gut-wrenching price collapse that you have to survive and whether the subsequent bear market is not a fun experience for anyone who's invested any amount of money in a very volatile or risky asset um, like Bitcoin. But if you can survive that, it's not necessarily all blue skies from there on out, but it is a much more enjoyable experience because of the community that you found, the intellectual interest that you've discovered, and just the confidence you have in knowing why you're in this space and it's not just for the profit, it's not just to get quick, uh, to get rich, but it's there's something more, something much more substantive and deeper beneath the surface of turning a profit uh, on this investment, which to be honest, it, it is a considerable reason why many people are here. It's a very promising asset and a lot of people are interested in investing in it with the expectation of a future return. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. And especially in these early adopter years, um, 
people who do stick around and do, who, who do keep their money in Bitcoin despite its volatility and enormous regular price crashes are here for a much uh, more significant reason besides the profit. Um, but back to the opt-in aspect of Bitcoin, um, it represents something we haven't really seen before in global finance and even personal finance. Um, it's sort of it, it, almost a monetary representation of the Lockean idea of, of voting with your feet that you, the, what Locke opposed is the idea of, well, if you don't like where you are, then just leave. And obviously he rejected that thesis by saying, well, no, you should be able, there should be structures in place that you should be able to change the environment politically you live in and you shouldn't have to just abandon it. Um, but we've never really had the option to just to vote with our dollars essentially and switch financial systems from one currency to another um, or one monetary regime to a totally separate different monetary regime. But Bitcoin gives us that opportunity. Um, no one is forcing us to use it. No one is forcing us or keeping us from from staying within the fiat monetary regime that we're in right now. Um, it's a parallel system that anyone can use, um, competes with the existing system in a variety of poignant ways, uh, the value of which is, I mean, as you mentioned, all the obituaries for Bitcoin that continue to be churned out, the advantage of the system is <clears throat> understood by very few people. And um, it's... Uh, Personally, I've never been more bullish on Bitcoin than I, I'm increasingly bullish as the days go by and throughout, I mean, it's true every passing day just because it's one more day that I've been in Bitcoin longer and my, bullish, my bullishness has um, accordingly increased. I'm more bullish on this than I ever have been and I think that there's um, just an untold amount of financial prosperity and technological advancement um, and 10,000 foot view here, but human flourishing to be reaped from um, the advent of Bitcoin and its continued adoption around the world. So I'll get off my soapbox now, but I, yeah, short answer is yes, I agree 100% with what you said. There's also this interesting parallel that even the US dollar in its early days was illegal and made up by people who wanted to overthrow the existing political regime. They wanted to get away as far as they could from the dominance and the political influence of Great Britain. And that's the reason why the US dollar came around. And that's also one of the reasons why the United States of America is not a parliamentary regime. And you have a mix of presidentialism with parliamentarism and you found the middle ground with the Congress. Actually, it's a full-fledged presidential regime in the sense that the president has the executive power. But yeah. if, with people like Madison and Jefferson, you found the perfect balance of powers, which seems to have worked for over 230 years. Yeah, it's it, the uh, power dynamics in the American federalist government system and the power dynamics within the Nakamoto consensus governance system that Bitcoin uses are fascinating to study in, in the way that they are in many ways similar. Um, I'll clear my throat just one second. And in the ways that they are staunchly unique. Um, and we can get back, we can get into that in a second, but I, I wanted to touch on the, the creation of the of American currency per se, which also is a history I find fascinating um, and bears many similar uh, similarities to Bitcoin in that um, obviously the 13 colonies trying to create their own local economies and then eventually uniting and trying to create this this sort of um, hacky national economy went through several iterations of failed currencies and monetary policies among other types of policies um, and the creation of, of a decentralized uh, censorship resistant value transfer network like Bitcoin went through that same iteration um, and we saw that the colonial money in uh, colonial America was an absolute disaster with hyperinflation wreaking havoc on um, a handful of southern colonies as well as um, northeastern colonies like New Hampshire and Rhode Island. Um, just a total disaster. People resorted to using things like tobacco certificates um, for actual exchange as money substitutes because the 
the fiat currency, the fiat paper bills issued by the local governments were worthless. Um, and then the federal government eventually, uh, the federal American government um, created a national currency through a series of bills and reforms and whatnot um, that came along after um, the United Kingdom stepped in because the American, the colonial currency system was in such bad shape that it threatened to jeopardize or at least to some extent destabilize British international trade routes. And the crown said, all right, you guys have gone far enough. This needs to stop. Um, and they set some sanctions on currency issuance and whatnot. And then the, the, the throughout the decades, um, the dollar came around, the American dollar. And we saw the same thing with something similar, I should say, with Bitcoin, where we saw several attempts to create a new uh, type of censorship resistant um, internet money uh, since the 80s. And Bitcoin was the first successful iteration of that. Um, and here, here we are today. But the power dynamics more specifically are fascinating um, because Bitcoin, Bitcoin functions best when it does little to nothing all the time. Like changes are an enormous deal in the, the Bitcoin source code. And similarly, um, so that being said, sort of the gridlock that exists created by Nakamoto consensus where the status quo stays the status quo and it is very difficult to change things is a similar alignment of incentives created to protect the institution that exists in the federal government itself because people hate gridlock in Congress and they hate when Congress, uh, so to speak, gets nothing done and whatnot. But that's how the institution is also designed to function. Um, bills are not intended to be passed rapidly um, or large numbers of them very quickly. Um, They're designed to be debated and discussed for long periods of time and gridlock is a feature, not a flaw of the federalist system um, and the, the tripart branch uh, government that we have in the United States um, in the same way that consensus in Bitcoin is designed to keep the status quo of the protocol in its current condition um, un until any proposed change receives obviously unanimous consent and is adopted. Um, and so the lack of progress or the lack of adaptation is often something that Bitcoin is critiqued for by so-called no coiners and developers of other projects, similar to Congress where a lack of progress or a lack of bills being passed or issues being addressed is a critique that's often lobbied at Congress, but both institutions a lack of doing something new in both institutions is actually a feature and shows that they're working as they're designed to. You obviously know a lot more about American politics and history than I do, and that comes with pretty evident reasons. But I'm happy that we got into this way of the discussion and we are walking on this way. As I usually regard Bitcoin as a very American invention, which abides to the American philosophy of the economy, not necessarily just the Austrian school, but it's about freedom and autonomy and the right to have your own property, which is unconfiscatable. Yeah. And this is actually a paradox as at the same time, Bitcoin is a very American invention, which takes decades of developments and research in the field of digital currencies and cryptography and, and computer science. But at the same time, it seems to work against the global interests of the United States of America as a political entity. As we have heard all these stories about Venezuela, which is under an economic embargo, and they are using Bitcoin for basically day-to-day -day uses in, you know, exchanges yeah. and barter. And you also hear about North Korea, and there were rumors about running mining farms and trying to bypass the international restrictions that they had in regards to trade. And you have all these regions like Palestine, which is also in a delicate political situation. And it's hard for them to have any kind of alliances and get into trades, but they can get 
humanitarian aids in Bitcoin. And that changes the rules of the game. And there's nothing that anyone can do about it. So at the same time, Bitcoin is very American, but against the American foreign affairs agenda. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think the idea that Bitcoin is very American might come from the fact that um, Americans are one of the largest Bitcoin investor, adopter, user uh, demographics. And that perception isn't necessarily a good thing or that isn't necessarily accurate. But I mean, at, at the stage that Bitcoin is right now, where it's something um, at least up until, well, I mean, yeah, still today, uh, for the most part, um, something that is largely used and adopted and known about by te highly technologically literate, um, more or less uh, socioeconomically well-positioned um, individuals is just sort of a reality of the condition of Bitcoin, uh, for better or worse. But obviously, several, a few years into the future, we hope to see that reality change considerably. Um, but I think also countries like America and even China um, and some uh, considerably uh, poorer uh, countries to the south, uh, south in Latin America, um, to the south of America, eat up a disproportionately large amount of news media headlines um, and stories from, say, Canada or England or Germany um, or ASEAN nations in Southeastern Asia um, that are on balance doing more or less of the same influential work in proportion to population size and uh, per capita wealth and whatnot, rapidly scaling the adoption of Bitcoin um, are often sort of left behind because the headline material isn't as catchy as it is uh, from American news. Um, but there are, there are huge, huge things um, in short happening all around the world for Bitcoin. And just because Americans are some of the wealthiest demographics in the world um, who happen to own a lot of Bitcoin right now um, is really a perception we want to change. Um, we mean, I can't speak for all of Bitcoin, but sort of the ethos that Bitcoin represents um, is something that should, should not be seen as uniquely American. Um, but I guess that's maybe the status quo of things right now in, in, in some ways. I don't think I was just referring to the idea that it's Americans who own most of the Bitcoin supply. As if you look at the Bitcoin white paper and you read a little, little bit about the history of Bitcoin, you know that it was actually Hal Finney with, who was an American citizen and received the first ever Bitcoin transaction. So it's safe to say that the first ever Bitcoin transaction took place within the territory of the United States. Oh, I see. And, and if you look at the white paper, you see names like um, Ralph Merkel, who was and is still alive. He's an American citizen. And Wei Dai, who graduated from the George Washington University. And I guess if you look at it, I think Adam Beck is British, so he's a bad example. Also, Nick Sabo, he is not mentioned in the white paper, but we know that he had the closest idea to Bitcoin with BitGold, and he's mm. also American. And the entire group of cypherpunks and the idea of digital cash, which derives from the works of David Chaum, it's all very American. It, it took place in a very narrow, we're in a very narrow group. And somehow maybe that it's ridiculous to think that you had this person who came from outside of the group and invented something which was way better and ahead of anything which they have de developed. And at the time, they didn't even take it seriously. And we know, historically speaking, that people like Adam Back didn't like Bitcoin until it hit the $1,000 mark. And that's when he actually realized that there's some value in it and it has a future. Yeah, it's uh, the the academic pedigree that Bitcoin comes from um, is quite remarkable, and to your point, does um, 
it does contain, I guess, a, a large number of um, Americans maybe who are cited in the white paper, but the cypherpunk movement writ large that Bitcoin was sort of born out of and multiple attempts to create earlier Bitcoins um, was most definitely not exclusively American. But I, I, I do see what you're, where you're coming from. Um, the point of Bitcoin, obviously, though, is to be a borderless, censorship-resistant, completely decentralized um, value transfer network that also happens to have native currency along with it, which is something that obviously cannot be native to a particular region or nation or country or, or body politic. Um, and that's exciting. Uh, but I guess in the white paper, there are a disproportionate amount of Americans represented, um, maybe not disproportionate relative to certain advancements and research spent on cryptography and um, decentralized protocols uh, that could lend themselves to create a, a digital cash like Bitcoin. But um, yeah, that's interesting. It's hard for me to imagine how something like Bitcoin could have come out of China or Russia or any other state which actually needs Bitcoin much more than the Americans, but at the same time doesn't have the same philosophy or the same history of freedom and private property. They don't really care in these regions about owning stuff and they they have a history of either being some kind of empire or being bound to a very authoritarian ruler. So their idea of liberty and sovereignty is rather contemporary and actually is due to the influence of the United States of America. Yeah, so the quality of uh, computer science and cryptographic academics in Asian countries is something that's a little bit outside of uh, my expertise, but I think that um, the, the paradox of Bitcoin maybe is that it is, at least early on, most rapidly adopted, um, you might say per capita adoption, in countries where, and again, this may be something controversial to say, but it, it's where it's least needed, um, that being like fairly stable, uh, highly developed countries like the United States and Canada and England and Germany and whatnot. Um, whereas other countries like North Korea or um, China or Russia or Venezuela or Argentina um, or Zimbabwe and are maybe objectively in much more need of something like Bitcoin, a stable currency. Um, but uh, have much lower adoption rates. Um, but it, regarding America as sort of this bastion of freedom, that's also a highly controversial thing to say. It depends on who you ask. And relative to other countries around the world, other political regimes, America is one of the freest, most liberty-abiding countries in the world, but it is by no means a model example of what it means to respect individual liberty and sort of Bitcoin came out of the cypherpunk culture, which had the main ethos of fighting against a system primarily championed by, or at least initiated by, um, American political powers to invade privacy and um, as far as informational security and on the financial side, a backlash to not necessarily uh, motivated by this, but the timing was highly coincidental and couldn't have been timed better, the 2008 financial crisis. Um, when Bitcoin launched as sort of a statement against um, or having the effect of initiating something that was successful in uh, fighting against the latest iteration of a financial collapse from a fundamentally broken system. Um, America is by no means an oppressive regime, but it is by no means an ideally free country either. And uh, Bitcoin will Bitcoin will go to where it's most needed. It's, I mean, you might think of it as sort of liberty arbitrage where people early on, maybe it sort of congregates in people who have um, disproportionately large amount of resources and technical literacy um, such that it's easier for them to adopt Bitcoin. But eventually as Bitcoin continues to mature, it will flow to areas where it's needed most. Um, and the oppression that certain peoples are ex experiencing right now because of their corrupt political and monetary regimes 
um, will be lifted as, as sort of Bitcoin helps them um, opt into a much better financial system. And from monetary freedom springs all other forms of freedom. Um, I think freedom of speech and the freedom of money are the two foundational rights that exist in the world. And once you have those locked down, um, pretty much every other freedom is guaranteed. Um, so there's Bitcoin represents a enormous amount of hope for people living in um, oppressive regimes um, or even maybe moderately free regimes like the United States that still have um, poignant rights violations existing right now. Um, Bitcoin has the potential to alleviate those situations and that's incredibly encouraging. Now that I think about it and I've listened to you talk about this topic, Bitcoin is much more American than 20th century United States of America. Mm. As the 20th century had the confiscation of gold, which happened in, I'm not sure about the year and I don't want to mess up, so I'll, I will not mention it. But that was a terrible event and it wasn't until the 70s that you were allowed once again to own gold and by that time the gold standard was gone. Yeah. And yeah. So the, the uh, FDR's gold confiscation, it was in the early 30s. Um, now, I, now I honestly can't remember. I want to say 33, but it might have been 32. Um, when essentially owning this particular precious metal was now illegal. Um, and <laughs> historians write about it as an arguably unconstitutional maneuver by FDR. Um, I would suggest it's pretty blatantly unconstitutional, but it does represent the pressure that a government feels when they have an agenda for manipulating the, their, the currency they issue in a certain way and there is a strong competitor that exists as a more or less a free market money. Um, and FDR aptly recognized the competition that gold presented as a store of value to the American dollar that um, his administration had certain plans to manipulate for their own political uh, agenda. Um, and the, the friendliness with which Bitcoin is received right now um, relative to how it could be received in regimes like the American political system uh, over the past decade honestly is somewhat surprising. Um, but that's not to say we'll continue this way forever and in the future we may see something like FDR's Gold Confiscation Act um, replay itself with a Bitcoin or Digital Asset Confiscation Act. Um, I think that will be much more difficult to execute for a variety of reasons, but it's certainly not outside the realm of possibilities. Sure, but if you think about James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, and especially Jefferson, I think I've read a research by Francis Puglio, who was one of the guests of your podcast. And he actually found documents in which Jefferson talks about the importance of gold as a currency. And he taught about a system in which the Americans would actually use gold and silver to trade. And I guess this predates the days of US dollar. And it's from the time when he was an ambassador in Paris. But nevertheless, it's still fascinating that the founding fathers who are usually quoted and misquoted and their ideas are often adapted to the various zeitgeists of whatever is going on. They are still, still relevant in the context of Bitcoin because it seems to me that the more I read about this more libertarian side of the founding fathers, and it's mostly Madison and Jefferson and probably John Jay, the more I actually realize that if they were alive today, they would love the idea that you can have a type of currency which cannot be confiscated and is neutral in terms of nation states. Yeah, a lot of, <clears throat> uh, well, not a lot of, I should say, but there is definitely a a considerable amount of the founding fathers who were huge proponents of um, metallic monies instead of currency issuance. Um, and there are a lot of 
interesting scandalous, not scandals per se, but scandalous or at, at least shady happenings around sort of the development of an American currency, um, even down to things like who printed the, the paper and whatnot, um, sort of handed us political favors in early American history. But gold and silver were definitely favored by Jefferson as currencies. Um, I believe in the papers you're referencing, I believe Jefferson referred to the inevitable future of um, paper currency as sort of being as worthless as maple tree leaves or something to that effect, um, which sort of around that time echoes a sentiment. Um, obviously, Voltaire is not <laughs> known for his economic theories, but even he had pretty strongly worded opinions on fiat money. Um, he said something to the effect of all paper currency eventually returns to its intrinsic value of zero, of being worth nothing. Um, and certain economic, political economic crises around that time, those decades, um, influenced those opinions of Voltaire and Jefferson. And hit, I mean, to date, history has borne out their opinions to be largely accurate that fiat monies are a categorically uh, unreliable, maybe easily manipulable way to um, provide a currency for a market to use. And there are obviously certain legal protections and uh, restrictions you can put in place to enforce the use of fiat currency in particular ways. But centuries down the road from the days of Jefferson, we've sort of come to this state of fiat inertia where we know nothing except a fiat monetary system. Uh, we have little to no recollection of a metallic money system or anything else besides simply just using dollars and euros and yen and whatnot. And which also makes Bitcoin so radically exciting because we're awakened to this other possibility that existed long before we came around, but we have had no experience with it, that there is an alternative monetary system we can use. We don't need to have a money that someone tells us how much it's worth and manipulates the supply and controls the production and whatnot. Um, but we can have all of that sort of removed into a totally decentralized system where no one is 100% responsible for its production and maintenance and value. Um, but instead, you might say everyone is in charge of it all at the same time. Um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing, but something that we haven't experienced in a while. And so those old opinions that Jefferson um, was expressing and other people like him thought about sort of critiques of fiat money are incredibly valuable to look back on because now Bitcoin is sort of reintroducing those ideas into our contemporary consciousness and the, the monetary zeitgeist we live in now um, and the change that Bitcoin will bear out and the way money is handled will exceed maybe even the wildest expectations of some of the hardcore anarcho-capitalists that were day one early Bitcoin adopters right now. It will be just a fundamentally reorienting of how we conceptualize money and how the the global monetary market and global economy in general function. I'm actually happy that I get to have this kind of conversation with somebody. And I think that the 18th century is my favorite of them all. As you have the American Revolution, the French Revolution, you have people like Voltaire, you have people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And usually when, when I read Rousseau, it's like, reading something which at some point in my life I thought about, but I never had the chance to develop to that great extent where it actually makes sense. And it's so radical and so mind-blowing sometimes that I just smile when I'm reading. And I'm not kidding. Even though he has these ideas which may be considered to more to the left wing, I actually... Like yeah. the fact that he was a non-conformist and he didn't like anybody who wrote around the same time. He, he was simultaneously friends and enemies with Voltaire and they wrote to each other very incisive and attacking letters. And he was also a friend and an enemy with David Hume, who was living in London at the time. And mm. 
they actually lived together for a few years, I think. And they got into a fight and he had this, I'm speaking of Rousseau right now. He had this kind of very crazy life, which made him become friends or start some kind of partnership with people and then leave a few years later and develop all sorts of curiosities from studying plants to politics to literature to the idea of property. And I think it's in his second contract, which refers to inequality. Not second contract, second discourse. I was speaking of the social contract, which is obviously the best known work of his But in his discourse on inequality, he says that the dumbest people in history are the first guy who delimitated, is that a word? Delineated. Delineated a piece of land. He made a crop and said, this is mine. And the second idiot is the one who believed it and said, I'm not going to touch it because it's it's (laughs) yours. But realistically speaking, if you read Nick Sabo's studies on the history of money and how societies have evolved, actually, it was money that helped us create communities and trust each other and has obliged us, more or less, has pushed us to get outside our communities and interact with the others and look for the resources and earn trust. Ultimately, money is a token of trust. You're getting into exchanges with somebody whom otherwise you wouldn't even talk to and you don't trust, but you're exchanging a resource which is trusted by both parties. And when you think about it in these terms, it's pretty mind-blowing. I was born in 92 and I guess you're younger than me. And I've never seen anything outside the fiat system in which you just exchange pieces of paper for various products. And you, at some point, you don't even think about it. You don't ask yourself, why? Why does this have any kind of value? You just go with the flow and evaluate everything in terms of how much money you have and how much money you can earn. But as soon as you get beyond this philosophy of doing trades and exchanging stuff with people, it actually starts to make sense. And I, I guess I, I wouldn't make too much of a business person because I, I tend to be overly and irrationally generous with people. And I don't know how to be mean and say, you get this done or else I, I'm not going to pay you. But... It's still an interesting, I I guess it would be useful to teach more of economics in school and make children understand why money has value. But then again, that's not in the interest of nation states and governments who would rather have people who blindly follow whatever monetary policy they have and never really ask questions. And that's why Bitcoin is great because you start asking questions Absolutely. It's, it's honestly, if you think about it and if you have the wherewithal to ask yourself, why is this piece of paper worth anything? You're left with easily a hundred times the number of questions than any answers you can produce. And part of the reason is because we aren't taught in our education systems that exist in countries around the world to understand how money works and why money is worth something. We can understand the intricacies of a complex global economy and a complex um, ever-expanding banking system and uh, how the intricacies of government work in almost every area except how money is produced and how monetary production came to be the way it is now, which sort of goes to the condition of fiat inertia that we're all living in. It's just what we're accustomed to and what we're used to and what we've always used. And we have, to some extent, it is um, the term that's often used for political participation, but also maybe political participation in terms of monetary uh, policies, um, the notion of rational ignorance, where we have little to no incentive to sort of, well, I mean, to some extent, we have an enormous incentive to, but in our day-to-day life, we have little to no incentive to prod ourselves to sort of 
snap out of the fiat inertia we exist in and ask ourselves, why are we doing what we're doing with this medium of exchange that we're using every day, all day? Why is this the way things are? Why did the status quo come to be the status quo? But Bitcoin is a crash course on that sort of realization, waking up to why the money we use is the money we use and what money is categorically and how, if at all, we should want to change the way that that works and a whole slew of other questions that we just don't ask ourselves. And sometimes those are uncomfortable questions to ask, which might be why people are somewhat um, disconcerted about the notion of Bitcoin being a thing that's increasingly popular because they don't want to face or have to wrestle with that or have to ask themselves, all right, why is this money money that I use and this other weird, strange new internet currency, why is that actually something that's bad and dumb, arguably? Um, those are questions people don't really want to wrestle with, but um, the task of wrestling with them now um, is large, but the reward is also equally enormous. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a beautiful thing to see those questions being brought to the forefront of our collective consciousness in, ter- in money terms, um, having like existed in societies for centuries that have just used paper or fiat money. Um, it's quite interesting. I think also the beauty of Bitcoin is that you start to learn about all sorts of domains that have nothing to do with the code itself. You learn about economics, you learn about world politics. You start to understand how the origins of money first emerged. But you don't really have to understand how the code works unless you're a specialist in this field and you have a background in computer science. And also the beauty of Bitcoin is that it doesn't matter where you come from, you are going to find some elements of your field of study into Bitcoin, unless of course you're doing music or arts or whatever. But if you do social sciences or hard sciences, you're even law. If you if you're doing law, you're going to be fascinated by the way the protocol reaches consensus uh, and how you have these developers who have their own system to propose BIPs and how they debate all these BIPs and how they come to conclusions and be review everything. That's still an interesting process. Yeah, Bitcoin is a crash course on, I don't think there's any necessarily any large discipline that Bitcoin does intersect with in some way, which is one very important reason why so many people remain interested in Bitcoin for so long, because it touches so many different areas of study. Um, But also that point that sort of regardless of your interest, you can find something in Bitcoin that applies to you and a comment you made a couple minutes ago about Bitcoin or money being sort of an element of trust. Um, both go to the fact that money per se um, creates communities of maybe otherwise totally disparate people that would have no other reason to interact with each other besides the fact that they share a common medium of exchange. And the fact that Bitcoin creates a community is is sort of undeniable. And it's something that is something I haven't always thought. Um, You talk to some sort of hardline Bitcoin maximalists and they reject out of hand the notion that Bitcoin creates a community. Um, But if you understand how money works, especially the trust element that money requires, that someone will actually recognize the objects you have as having the same value you recognize it to have, that sort of mutual reliance or assurance or trust only comes from a community in which people accept a common medium of exchange as representing as some sort of abstract representation of value. Not everyone all around the world accepts the same money. And that may be for certain political reasons, which you might say are artificially created monetary communities, but also as currencies evolve, it's sort of this explosive free currency market we've seen come about since 2009 when Bitcoin was first introduced. Um, There are communities built around accepting these new crazy digital assets as mediums of exchange and however long those communities will last and how viable the projects are per se is uh, 
very much an open question to some people and definitely very much not to others. But regardless, there exist those communities that people represent something as having value and other people within that community share that rep recognition. People outside of said community don't. So your money is only so good insofar as you have a community of people willing to accept it from you and people outside of that community will not accept your money. That, those two truths, that realization create the reality that money exists within the confines of a certain community that is accepted by all the participants, all the members of that community. Um, and the community around Bitcoin is growing at a shockingly fast pace. Um, and will I mean, expectations are it will only continue to keep that pace, if not um, accelerate it until eventually everyone is um, swallowed into this community. Um, which would be a great reality. But point being, Bitcoin definitely creates a community because money creates communities because money relies on trust and that trust can only exist within a community that recognizes some sort of money as having the same value that everyone else recognizes it as having. Speaking of realizations, I just saw on your Twitter profile that you call yourself a Bitcoin noob and you stole uh, this from, I guess, Udi Wertheimer. Yes. Who, is a Bitcoin developer and he still considers himself to be a noob. And at the we same do, time, it do. makes sense to consider yourself a noob in the extent that there is always something new to find out and you can never say that you've learned everything about it. And I, I think the first time when I was shocked about this fact was when Andreas Antonopoulos made a speech in which he said that every day he follows the news about Bitcoin and he still feels like he's overwhelmed and cannot actually keep up with everything that's going on. And in yeah, this absolutely. regard, maybe that we're all noobs. But if you check LinkedIn and you look at various people who got into Bitcoin, maybe for speculative reasons, they call themselves thought leaders. They call themselves experts and gurus and they sell their advice books in which they give you all sorts of tips on what you should do and what you should know. And yeah, it's funny. It's uh, Udi and I use that moniker a little bit tongue in cheek, but also your point's very valid that there is always something new, many new things to learn in Bitcoin with every passing day. And it's almost impossible to keep up with it, um, keep up with everything. And there is certainly way more about Bitcoin that I do not understand than the small fraction of things that I have managed to sort of comprehend. Um, but at the same time, that is sort of part of what makes it so fun, the difficulty required to understand this. And um, I'm sure you and I and all of your listeners have had friends who have maybe expressed the sentiment that learning about Bitcoin is difficult and they sort of seek answers for where is just sort of a list of things that I can learn, like a syllabus almost for understanding Bitcoin. And such a thing would be like very easy and fun for new learners to understand Bitcoin, but at the same time sort of comes with the territory that learning Bitcoin is in itself a little bit of a chore um, and you have to dedicate a considerable amount of time to understanding how to learn about Bitcoin in addition to actually learning Bitcoin uh, before you can make considerable progress up the steep learning curve that is Bitcoin. So there, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and whether you've been in Bitcoin since um, October 31st, 2008 or January 1st, 2019, um, it's, there, there's always a lot to learn. There's always an abundance of things you don't understand and no one should take themselves too seriously. Um, in the space of which I am guilty plenty of times. Um, but no one, no one should take themselves too seriously and everyone should always remember that there's a lot they don't understand and always more that they could learn. Speaking of friends, I noticed also on your Twitter profile that you speak about dating and how you have trouble speaking to girls who don't know anything about Bitcoin and you try to avoid the topic, but they discover it and then they ask you why you're so obsessed with it. And I guess in this regard, we have somewhat of the same problem, even though the girl I'm seeing right now, she doesn't really ask questions and I'm happy with it because 
on one side, if she asked me maybe a year ago about Bitcoin, I would say, oh, well, I can teach you, I can show you, I can be that guy who will help you understand it. But right now, I don't even know where to start. And unless she has the curiosity to do it herself and then ask specific questions about topics and have debates and exchange ideas, I, I don't want to do it from scratch. So maybe that I'm luckier than you are. <laughs> it is it is quite an ordeal. Um, and I have a lot of fun sort of uh, humorously sharing some of my dating escapades on Twitter that I've come across since I recently uh, moved from Washington, D.C. to New York. And, and the, the experiences I, I think you're referencing are from the my experiences dating uh in the New York City scene, which is a lot of fun. Um, but it's also sort of a tricky question when your date asks, so what do you do? And do you do Bitcoin more or less? Um, I work at uh, Masari, um, a data uh, aggregation company uh, based out of New York City, specifically focused on digital assets. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's a tricky answer because I don't know of many professions or industries that have sort of the odd, maybe cringy stigma associated with them, like someone who works in the crypto, Bitcoin, digital asset space full time has or carries. Um, and so every now and then I just sort of chronicle some fun experiences I've had or interesting, sometimes disappointing experiences I've had with girls um, who find out I have a deep and abiding love for Bitcoin and that's not really their flavor. Um, and it's, uh, we go our ways, but it's, it's fun to look back on. Um, but I, I can share some positive news, I guess. Right now I am seeing someone who, similar to the girl you described, I suppose, the temperament uh, that you're seeing, she knows of my deep and abiding love for Bitcoin and asks questions occasionally, but is sort of ambivalent on the whole about the entire thing. Um, and so we discuss it briefly and it's sort of just a, a thing that sits on the shelf, um, at least for her, but very much not for me. Um, and she can abide my interest in it quite well. So there's promise there, but in the past dating or, or trying to date or talking with people, girls, um, who don't share sort of a fanatical love for Bitcoin has been, has been quite an experience. Um, and as I've shared those experiences on Twitter, other Bitcoiners have said, yes, I'm lucky to in some cases be married to a spouse who is an avid Bitcoiner like me, or I know your pain. I've tried explaining to my dates about my love for Bitcoin has not gone over very well. Um, so definitely not something I experience uh, on my own. It's, it's just amusing to see sort of the reaction of people outside of the space where there may be to some extent like romantic elements introduced to the situation, their response to someone who does work on this uh, stuff or at least is interested in it quite a bit um, and maybe works on it full time. Um, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, combination, romantic interests and Bitcoin. Um, so we'll see how, we'll see how this goes. But, but for now I, I may have, I may have gotten lucky uh, with this particular girl. So um, cross your fingers and knock on wood and hopefully this works out. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I just knocked. Okay. <laughs> but thinking about it, when I first met this girl, she asked me about what I do. And I said, you know, I write articles about Bitcoin. And she said, but that's not really money. <laughs> and I said, OK, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you. I, I don't really want to convince you otherwise. If you're going to find out later by yourself, then OK. And you're going to say that I'm right and you're wrong. Otherwise, I don't really here i don't mind it you can think that i work for some kind of crypto bros that you see on the news when mm. we have these types of reports about people who got lucky investing in bitcoin maybe they bought bitcoins to buy drugs on silk road but they were so stoned that they forgot to buy drugs and they just held their coins and realized in a few years that they were millionaires i have no idea yeah. but I don't want to be associated with these people. It's sad that mainstream media usually looks for these stories to portray an entire group of people as being that strange. Yeah, but dating is, um... with Bitcoin. I just wanted to say that before this, I I used to 
ask the girls to pay for the bill and I would give them my half in Bitcoin or Litecoin or whatever shitcoin I was having. And this was mostly in 2017. And at the time I was like, you're going to thank me later. <laughs> it did, it didn't turn out so well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on uh, your time frame, but in, in five or 10 years, they might end up thanking you. That's, that's a very interesting approach though. I, I did not, I would not have thought to do that. Um, I'm sure, uh, well, I can't imagine the reactions you may have gotten from um, pulling that, but I, I imagine I would have gotten some very peculiar looks or at least a chuckle or something um, if I tried to do that as well. But that, that's, <laughs> that's very amusing. That's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, dating and Bitcoin, there's, I mean, it's not exclusive, obviously, to sort of dating or trying to date someone who doesn't understand or like or know much about Bitcoin. But people in general, if their opinion is set one way such that they think Bitcoin is sort of hogwash and there's nothing you can do to convince them otherwise, there's, I mean, not much you can do to try and change their mind. You can recommend reading or listening materials like this podcast, for example, um, the Bitcoin Takeover podcast, and have them be introduced to other people who think the same way that you do. But your best bet is really just to sort of let them go on their way and think whatever opinion they're inclined to think at that time. Maybe they'll change their mind in the future. Maybe they won't. There's no real benefit from you expending energy to try and change their mind. Um, maybe an initial effort, but beyond that, no real incentive or benefit because you, the chances of success are pretty low, especially for something as polarizing and controversial as Bitcoin. Um, so just let them think what they think and hope for, hope for the best at some point. Yeah, maybe sometimes I feel guilty in the sense that I could make an extra effort and tell them stories maybe about the hyperinflation which took place in Romania in the 1990s, which maybe that they don't even remember because most of the girl side dates are in their 20s and they were probably not even born when this happened. But nevertheless, I, I guess I could make an extra effort to do it, but from my experience, it's a bad idea. And unless they have the ideological predisposition to actually learn about it, or they have this kind of curiosity to learn, they're not going to do it. And I guess part of the reason why I was turning them into coiners for whatever reason, by mm -hmm. giving them small amounts and teaching them how this mobile wallet works, was also because I was hoping that they would go home and maybe check out something about what they just received or get themselves informed because it's different when you actually own something. It's a kind of feeling which somewhat obliges you to become curious. You're asking yourself, okay, so I, right now I own this small amount of Bitcoin. What do I do with it? How do I hold it? When do I sell it? Yeah, I guess all, I all these questions should at least occupy their minds for a while. And maybe there's a chance that they will start reading or watch some kind of YouTube videos. And I hope that they don't stumble upon some scams, but that's beyond my control. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, I, giving away coins, um, Bitcoin, or if you're inclined to give away some other type of coin is a more or less tried and true way of getting people at least exposed, uh, sort of unavoidable by the fact that you're giving it to them, but also hopefully maybe interested in learning more about it. Um, and I, I'd say there's a decently high success rate with that outcome as well, getting people interested by giving them coins. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's a good, a good tactic. And, uh, maybe, maybe I, if I, if I go on a date with someone new, um, or any of our listeners can tweet at us and tell us if they tried on a date, uh, turning their dates into coiners by halving their date, pick up the tab and then compensating them for the check with some sort of cryptocurrency. That would be, that'd be a fun story to hear. I'd want to know how that turns out. Usually it, it's not a good idea to do it in the middle of a bull run. Mm. <laughs> as there's a high chance that the price will collapse and a bear market will follow. 
and then you're not going to get any good responses and if you still keep in touch with that person then it's better not to mention it or maybe just ask them do you still have those coins and they're going to say yeah and then tell them <laughs> please don't look at the price <laughs> keep them for five to ten years or something and then check exactly. the price exactly so how did we get here uh, uh oh right we were talking about bitcoin and politics and i have no idea why i mentioned dating i think it was the fact that you're a bitcoin noob right now and i oh I yes bitcoin noob scrolled Great. through your profile but I really wanted to ask you what you think about the recent rumor about Russia turning Bitcoin into a reserve currency to bypass some of the restrictions that they currently have in terms of trade. Yeah, it's a very interesting proposition um, and to the credibility of the news item itself. I don't know how much of it is real and how much of it is purely speculative. Um, the economist or economic journalist, I'm not entirely sure what his occupation is, who sort of tweeted about this stuff on Twitter. Uh, I messaged him after I saw those tweets and we chatted a bit, um, just very briefly. And he said he was open to discussing what he shared about a little bit more um, in sort of the context of recording a podcast episode. But He's sort of since gone AWOL, and I haven't heard anything back from him um, about details of the news item he was sharing and finding a time to chat and whatnot. Um, but as tends to happen with sort of those sorts of rumors, crypto news outlets picked it up very quickly and circulated it pretty widely. Um, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Uh, we know that sort of uh, Russia and Putin have been aware of and more or less interested in cryptocurrencies, more specifically Ethereum, than Bitcoin, I should say, uh, for a considerable amount of time. Um, but whether or not they're like very aggressively making it one of their reserve assets right now uh, is, in my mind, at least highly speculative. Um, but that's not to say there's not a good case for that behavior. Quite to the contrary, there's an excellent case to be made that governments should do that. And I have friends and, and uh, prominent Bitcoiners around the world who are doing that, specifically with central bankers in uh, nations like Ghana and the Bahamas, um, and uh, we have a handful of lobbyist uh, think tank groups in the United States um, doing similar educational work, not necessarily lobbying the government to accept Bitcoin as sort of a reserve asset, um, but educational work nonetheless. And it, it's very important. There's a strong case to be made for why governments should adopt Bitcoin, um, and I think we see or in my mind, or worse, a lot of oppressive regimes capitalizing on this potential incentive, like Maduro, who is mining Bitcoin and infamously confiscating Bitcoin miners' hardware and repurposing it for his government's Bitcoin mining purposes. And Kim Jong-un in North Korea mining Bitcoin for years, and I mean, presumably stockpiling quite a number of coins over there. And now maybe Russia um, acquiring a large number of Bitcoins as well. Um, Governments, I mean, any early adopter, regardless of your position or nature, odds are that Bitcoin hasn't even begun to reach its full value potential or even a half or a quarter of its full value potential in terms of a spot price or exchange rate um, or purchasing power. And investing in that now, buying Bitcoins now, is very likely to have a strong payoff in the future. And these sorts of governments realize that. Um, and the fact that these sorts of oppressive regimes are capitalizing on that is a bit problematic for the ethos of Bitcoin in my mind, but that's not to say that any other government and governments in general don't have a strong incentive to adopt Bitcoin because they most definitely do. Right now I'm looking at the Twitter feed of Vladislav Jinko, who is the economist who came up with the rumor that Vladimir Putin himself is interested in buying I think it was $10 billion worth of Bitcoin, which yeah. he mentioned. And he said on January 12th that he promises to fight for the freedom of Bernard Madoff, whom he thinks is the true Satoshi Nakamoto. And that's insane. If you look up Bernard mm -hmm. Madoff, 
He is about seven or close to eight years old. And he has worked at Wall Street for more, most of his life. And he ran a real Ponzi scheme with stocks at the stock market. And he doesn't have any of the credentials or the background that we should expect from a person like Satoshi Nakamoto, who was an expert in the evolution of money. He understood very clearly how the incentive system works and game theory. And he was the first person to successfully solve that Byzantine general's problem and create the kind of situation in which it's much more beneficial to support the system than to attack it. And there's a lot of cryptography and computer science getting into Bitcoin. So it makes no sense for somebody like Bernard Madoff to be Satoshi. And the fact that the same economist who claims that Putin is personally interested in Bitcoin makes these claims is detrimental to the reputation of the individual. Like, is this a credible source at all if he supports this idea that a Wall Street guy who is behind bars right now is Satoshi Nakamoto? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't familiar with that particular tweet, but I, I'm not entirely shocked. Um, Bernie Madoff is as tried and true of a scam artist, a fraudster as maybe there, there is in recent history. Um, and pretty undoubtedly not Satoshi Yakimoto, at least in my mind. Um, but if that it just sort of goes to the hilarity of a lot of these news items that crop up in crypto circles um, and Russia going big on um, buying Bitcoin is maybe based on that content. I mean, sort of, so the erroneousness of that particular claim, Bernie Madoff being Satoshi, obviously doesn't counteract the potential trueness or falseness of Putin buying a lot of Bitcoin. But from our perspective, it definitely adds a lot of color to the end that it's probably false. Um, it could be cool if Putin buys a lot of Bitcoin. Um, maybe not so much given his tendencies for sort of uh, reinforcing an oppressive violent regime. But um, I mean, everyone, I guess, should buy Bitcoin more or less. Everyone can buy Bitcoin. Um, that's sort of the point of the whole system. But enriching Putin's regime isn't necessarily uh, at the top of my wish list for geopolitical events. Sure. And I guess it would be nice if the West was the first to adopt Bitcoin and acknowledge its failure in terms of managing a state currency or a multi-state currency, which is, isn't really backed by anything, not any kind of gold or precious metal reserves. But at the same time, I usually have this kind of conversation with guests on this podcast, and it's about who you think will adapt, will adopt, not adapt, adopt Bitcoin first. The states which actually need it in terms of economic freedom or the ones which actually have economic freedom and have the large capital to actually acquire it. More precisely, do you think that the adoption will come from those that we call right now the unbanked or the ones under oppressive regimes who are trying to escape them or by the privileged Westerners who actually have decent wages and can afford to spare some amounts to buy Bitcoin every month? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, obviously in the first um, five, six years of Bitcoin, maybe six or seven years of Bitcoin, a lot of people who bought uh, and held considerable amounts of Bitcoin were sort of the economic and educational and socio, uh, sociologically privileged individuals. Um, but that fact is quickly changing um, to a much more balanced, um, even disproportionately skewed adoption uh, 
scheme such that disadvantaged people are adopting, what you might say relatively disadvantaged people are adopting Bitcoin in much, um, much higher rates than previously. Um, all that to say, I think in the next 10 years, we will see enormous waves of adoption from what you might categorize as socioeconomically disadvantaged individuals who have uh, access to Bitcoin in ways they never had before in terms of just um, categorical real, uh, categorical accessibility per se, regardless of the difficulty and uh, like rudimentariness of the access, but also the quality of the access, polished user experience, reliable service and whatnot. Um, I think we'll see just an explosion of that, those products and services for disadvantaged people in the next 10 years. So I guess I would pick um, maybe the, the demographic who needs it the most will adopt at a much faster pace um, over the next 10 years. And that will be exciting to watch. I also think right now we are in the middle of a paradigm shift in terms of Bitcoin narrative. I think it was established around 2017 that Bitcoin is primarily a store of value. But now that we actually have the Lightning Network to help small transactions get written into blocks in a way that doesn't actually bloat the blockchain and you have this second layer to handle these operations, we can actually have many more microtransactions, which means that Bitcoin can scale. And the paradigm shift in terms of discourse and narrative, which I am witnessing right now, has more to do with Gab.com, which was not allowed to have a bank account or got banned multiple times around 2018 and finally found its refuge in Bitcoin. Even though I don't necessarily agree with the core community which backs Gab.com, it's still interesting. And we also have personalities like Jordan Peterson who got banned from Patreon and people who have their PayPal funds frozen and it's this kind of awakening in which they realize that Bitcoin cannot be confiscated and it can provide to them the same kind of financial incentives that they used to receive through crowdfunding somewhere else. And they, that Bitcoin can also provide the banking services which banks used to provide before actually stopping their service. So. I think right now Bitcoin is going to become much more of an instrument of freedom and a lot more people are going to understand that it's actually about independence and autonomy and sovereignty and that money is actually a mean of expression. And the fact that you can transact money in a free way means that you are actually possess free speech. And Absolutely. Up until this point, it was all about libertarians who are looking for sound money. But there's a very small niche for sound money. Not many people care about it. But in terms of free speech and understanding that money is also speech and it leaves traces behind it, then I guess we're going to see a greater adoption just because we are also shifting the narrative towards freedom of speech to Bitcoin. Yes, I agree. Um, I think people will be increasingly aware of the power they have in choosing one type of money to use over another and the empowerment they'll receive from choosing a money that is in many ways more free in its use um, and value security and value retainment um, than maybe the currency that they use um, right now. I don't know, I don't really understand how you cannot be, how you can understand sort of the things that Bitcoin promises to be and not be bullish on Bitcoin's future once people understand um, those, those realities about Bitcoin. Um, there are four fundamental, um, I can't pull it up in right now, but there are four fundamental freedoms that money um, tries to confer on someone who's using money. 
um, the freedom to sort of buy whatever you want uh, from whomever you want, when you want, and accept or reject the conditions under which that transaction happens. And if you look at those four freedoms, that comes from um, sort of an article called the, the Sociology of Money, a read that I found very fascinating. And zero fiat currencies can claim to confer all four of those freedoms on individuals who use that as them as money. But with Bitcoin, you can buy from whoever you want, whenever you want, you can buy whatever you want, and you can, as a merchant or patron, choose to accept or reject the conditions under which such a transaction might occur. And so all four of those boxes are checked for Bitcoin. Bitcoin, out of, right out of the gate, exceeds the sort of inherent liberties transferred onto someone who uses Bitcoin compared to fiat currencies. And when people, and that's just a small list, just sort of pulled from this random academic paper. But when people understand sort of what this list is getting at, the inherent liberty conferred on someone that uses Bitcoin by Bitcoin, um, there's really no reason not to choose not to use it, um, especially in countries where your currencies may be unreliable, your access to these financial tools are restricted, um, and also to an extent in more stable developed economies like the United States. But um, freedom is ubiquitously attractive, no matter what your current political or uh, economic system is like right now. And once the freedom Bitcoin offers increasingly penetrates, our collective consciousness will, um, will, it will see market adoption. And I'm pretty, pretty bullish on that fact. But at the same time, it's just so convenient to use centralized services and use your credit card for which you don't even have to remember the four digit pin because you can just walk into the bank office and say you forgot your pin and they're going to assign a different one to you. And in the case of Bitcoin, it's difficult because you have to take responsibility. You have to be autonomous, but it doesn't come with the privileges of having this kind of paternal authority, which watches over everything that you do and can help you along the way. You have to actually take charge of your actions. You have to own your Bitcoin, both phys not physically, but in terms of ownership, but also in terms of knowledge and knowing how to use them and being responsible for the way that you use them. And that to a lot of people is too much. Plus the idea that ideally you should be running your own node so that you confirm your own transactions and you also help the network become much more decentralized. That's difficult for people to understand, especially after hundreds of years of central banking and having these commercial banks, which more or less are extensions of nation states as they serve functions, which maybe that would seem abusive if nation states did them. But the fact that you have this pluralism of financial institutions, which play several roles and help you do various economic activities, while they also collaborate with the governments and give them all kinds of documents and everything that is required for them to be compliant. That's, you know, easy for the average person to understand and you don't have to worry. And this is why Bitcoin is such an awakening because you're, you're put in front of this situation with, in which you have to learn, you have to figure out and I cannot think of many people who are actually willing to take this plunge or go down the rabbit hole for the purpose of attaining their freedom. Not many, a lot of us have gotten used to the idea that we are free by default and there's not much or anything to do about it. We are free just because we were born free. We don't really fight for our own freedom or we do not see this kind of um, power structure in which every day of our lives we either gain more freedom in relation to our relationships or our governments or we lose it just because we are ignorant and we don't care. 
And I'm pretty sure that I said a lot and it's about 4 a.m. here, but I'm trying to stay coherent and make sense. No, that's absolutely accurate. Um, I forgot how late it was in your time zone, <laughs> but uh, I, I guess maybe I can wrap up on this note that just like energy or risk in financial markets, you can never sort of uh, completely eliminate the need for trust. Um, it can sort of change forms and representations and maybe be minimized to some degree, but you can never eliminate it completely or destroy it. And so what Bitcoin promises to do is, which is scary for some people and a huge relief to others, um, I would argue maybe it should be universally a relief, seen as a relief, but it transfers trust from being placed in a separate autonomous third party with complete control over very critical things like your financial well-being transfers that trust to you as an individual instead of having someone else be a point of failure sometimes you even a single singular point of failure for your financial well-being bitcoin now makes you your own single point of failure and that makes you shoulder an incredibly large amount of responsibility which is at the same time sobering and relieving um, and a huge task for people who are used to living in a situation where that's just a wildly radical way of, of living. And so in combination with learning how Bitcoin works and creating infrastructure to allow Bitcoin to work, mentally preparing yourself to become someone who uses Bitcoin and the financial responsibility that it entails is a huge ask. Um, and it will be quite interesting to watch that sort of responsibility develop as society increasingly becomes aware of and uses Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, maybe end on that thought. Well, I'm really happy that we got to talk and I have no idea why you contacted me so early on because you didn't know anything about me and it was just like, oh, you're doing this podcast. I want to be in it. And then I saw that you're doing your own podcast, which is called The Coin Pod. And I said, why don't we do this as a crossover episode? And I actually want you to publish this before I wrap up everything and publish the entire season because we had a really great discussion. And this is a great teaser for what's about to come with the 10 guests that I'm going to have in the first season. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always... I'm always happy to talk about Bitcoin and I scrolled through your profile and looked at the project you're building on the Bitcoin Takeover podcast and it looked like a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm glad to have come on the show and chat with you and I look forward to this episode being produced and released. Um, a lot of people, I hope a lot of people enjoy maybe some of the nerdy rambly things that we talked about, um, but I definitely enjoyed it. If you're glad, then I'm glad. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I'm very happy that we had this kind of discussion, which I don't usually get to have. I'm, I'm not aware of many people who have a background in political science or international affairs. It's usually economists or computer programmers or people who have this predisposition for a libertarian ideology. But in this podcast, I actually had people like Donald McIntyre, who presents himself as a marketing guy, but if you talk to him, he's much more like an anthropologist. And he tells you about the evolution of the human brain and how we got to perceive value and how, I guess he read most of it from Nick Sabo, but at the same time, it's still great to hear this kind of opinion in a podcast. I'm not sure how many people are going to listen to this first season but I hope they do and they learn something new because otherwise it's just two guys exchanging opinions in what otherwise is kind of a big echo chamber. But exchanging ideas regardless of the audience is always worthwhile in my opinion. So I had, I had a lot of fun. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Sure. And we should do this again because I, I don't feel like we have exhausted the topics and if I wasn't so tired, I could still ask you a few questions and have this, no. which are more specific about world politics and stuff, because I guess we got sidetracked a little. We did. We did. We definitely did not uh, do all the topics we tried to touch on justice. We could, we could talk for an, a long time more about the things that we addressed. Um, 
we should do it again. Sure. I'm happy I found you. And maybe in season two, we're going to have another special episode. That sounds great. I would love that. So thank you for listening. And just so you know, this was also a crossover with the coin pod, which will publish the episode first. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on, Vlad.